Good evening, Assalamu Alaikum, and welcome to Sports Extra with the latest round of, of sports tonight on PTV World. I'm Mehmet Nawaz. And I'm Sabir Hazir, youth football coach and sports analyst. Right, let's take a look at the lineup that me and Sabil have for tonight, and we'll be discussing that in detail. We will, of course, be starting off with football, and in football, it is the Carabao Cup, where we know that Arsenal and Liverpool's game has been postponed. But Chelsea were on the winning note as they beat Tottenham Hotspur by 2-0. Now, I talked about the fact that maybe Thomas Rochelle has probably, you know, eased a bit of frustration. They solved the Lukaku matter as well. This is their chance of getting a silverware this season. Otherwise, their chances in the league are already down and out. But a uh, good game for Chelsea, one would say. Uh, Tottenham probably wanted more. They'd be frustrated. They could have done more. Uh, and uh, probably they want to, you know, reconsolidate when it comes to uh, other games as well. But Chelsea has been dominant in this first leg. Liverpool, of course, has gotten their request approved of their postponement with Arsenal in the other semi as well. Uh, after the football, we will be talking about uh, some interesting things going on in the world as well. Why I say interesting? Because it's absolutely absurd where we've got number one tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, who was first allowed to come to Australia without being vaccinated. He's, of course, been an advocate of not being vaccinated, of non-vaccination, that is. And then, of course, uh, after a lot of backlash from the people from uh, uh, not just Australians, but all over the world, uh, Australian government had to review their decision. And Scott Morrison, their prime minister, also gave a tweet where he said in that tweet that uh, his uh, visa has been revoked and uh, we would not let our borders to be breached. And, of course, he would now be returned. But the Serbian president came out with a strong statement against the Australian government. So it's now become more of a political issue as well between governments. But the fact is... Number one, why would you let somebody come to your borders when he's not vaccinated? Even if he's Djokovic, you've got a very strict policy where Australians have not been able to go visit their families, go to funerals, visit their loved ones on marriages and ceremonies. So it's been very tough state to state from Australia, which has the strongest lockdowns in the world when we talk about COVID. So I think this is absolutely absurd and this really uh, needs some uh, highlights as well. And obviously, I think we need to discuss this in detail because this is a decision that has put everyone's safety at jeopardy, not just at Australian Open, but at large for the Australian community as well. Uh, after that, we will, of course, uh, be moving on to cricket. And in cricket, it's Australia's dominance that continues in the Ashes with Usman Khwaja. Uh, with this blistering century in the fourth test of the Ashes, England having no clue after more than 400 runs, eight wickets gone, declared England were about 13 without losing any wickets, so they looked down and out of the game already. So let's see if they're able to hang on or not, but looks like Australia is going to dominate. And after that, we'll be talking about the PCB awards for uh, various categories that take place tonight. We'll have the winners very soon. Women's Cricketer of the Year, Men's Cricketer of the Year, Test Cricketer of the Year, ODI Cricketer of the Year, T20 Cricketer of the Year. You've got the Emerging Cricketer of the Year, Domestic Cricketer of the Year, and also uh, the Most Impactful Cricketer of the Year as well. A lot of awards up for grabs. Shine Shah really being nominated in five categories. He's probably got the best chance of winning. And then, of course, we know that uh, Fawad Alam has also been nominated for multiple times as well this season. So it's a good uh, initiative. I think we'll be discussing about that in detail and we will be talking about these awards for the year 2021 in detail and uh, getting to know all the nominations and, of course, their uh, personal performances and personal milestones as well. Starting our show off uh, with uh, the fact that we're going to be discussing the Carabao Cup. We've got a report on that. Let's go take a look and then continue the discussion. Chelsea beat Tottenham in the first leg of the Carabao Cup semi-final. Kai Havertz gave Chelsea an early lead when he ran on to Marcus Alonso's through ball. The Blues' second was a known goal as Changanga headed the ball into teammate Ben Davies' shoulder and it flew into the net. Spurs had to wait until the 50th minute for a shot with Harry Kane's free kick saved by Kepa. Saul stepped up for his seventh Chelsea start since joining the Blues on loan from Atletico Madrid in September, operating in a more familiar central midfield role. Chelsea boss Thomas Tuchel was left to heap praise on the 27-year-old for finally finding his Stamford Bridge rhythm after almost four months of struggle. Liverpool and Arsenal play in the other semi-final with their games on 13th and 20th January after the first leg was rearranged because of Covid cases in the Liverpool camp. Chelsea beat Tottenham. There you have it. All you need to know about the Carabao Cup action and what's been happening. So Sabil, first of all, uh, I understand that it's been very tough for Chelsea. Uh, activities on the playing field and off it as well because obviously that Lukaku matter was uh, a frustrating issue as well but it got solved. Uh, if you talk about the league itself, uh, their draw against Liverpool put them out of the title race then they've not been on a winning note as Tuchel wanted them to do. Uh, this win of course is a bit of consolidation, a bit of relief for probably Thomas Tuchel and the entire Chelsea management. 
Yeah, I think it was something that after the Lukaku uh, news and the fact that they resolved it, this was the it was much needier, but it was also very well done because the fact is they brought Lukaku back in the side. He didn't score, but he was very he was very very present throughout. He was mm -hmm. a big presence. He was causing problems, winning free kicks, and just being a nuisance. Uh, the manager praised him after the game as well. So the fact is that they need praise for that. The fact that they had this issue where he wanted to leave, they resolved it, put him back in the squad, and immediately he starts playing fairly well. So that's good to see that there's no hiccups. Apart from that, the way the team set up, I think Saul, was mentioned in the package, deserves all the credit in the world. He was phenomenal in the center of the park. And the fact that with all these injuries, you're talking about the problems Chelsea have. Mm -hmm. They've had problems with injury, they've had problems with uh, a lot of fixture congestion, they, and they've had their squad depleted, which is why they've seemed to have just dropped out of this title race. But the fact now that Saul's coming in, he's playing well. The players who are being brought in are performing. It's a really good sight to see and well-deserved winners. They missed a lot of chances, could have been a far bigger scoreline. Spurs looked like they were two leagues below mm -hmm. Chelsea in that game. 2-0, I think, was uh, flattering to Spurs. Uh, that, that's very true, but obviously we wanted more from Spurs, didn't we? Because we've been seeing a new uh, energy coming into them and obviously their manager also enjoying a record of being the, uh, you know, having the highest streak of being unbeaten. Uh, if you talk about new managers coming onto the scene for Tottenham ever as well. So probably he, he'd want more from that game going into the second one now. I think we all did, but after the match, uh, Conte as well said that there's a gap between them and Chelsea. There is a gap in quality and I think it was exposed um, maybe that's brought him back down as people back down to the level that Spurs are actually mm -hmm. at. Now we know that, look, they're good, they're on good form, they are, they're very good players mm -hmm. in that squad. But as a team, as a unit, they're not at that level where Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City are. They have a second leg to try and bring it back. I don't think they will. They might score in that game. But if you look at this match here, it, was, it doesn't show you any way that they can get back in. They were not really threatening Chelsea much at all. Lloris actually made a few really good saves in that game. Uh, the second goal, if you look at it, is comical. One of the most comical own yeah, goals I've true. seen. Tanganga has no pressure <laughs> on him. Headed straight onto, I think it was Davies, and it goes into the net. And then the first goal they get, it's another defensive mistake. But at least he got his name on the score. Line, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, that counts for something. But you expected, I think now we probably all come down a bit, back down to it. That looks, Spurs and Conte were doing well, but this is about their level. When they play at Chelsea, Liverpool, Man City, they'll get found out. We've talked about many teams, Sabil, uh, how important that, you know, their combinations and their squads that have got up, obviously going on to the depleting side, player changes and a lot of stuff happening. But I think we've not discussed much about Tottenham and how important this transfer window can be for them and their plans. 100%. I think we've been too caught up in perhaps mm. how uh, Chelsea are going to deal with their depleted midfield, how Newcastle are going to bring in players. Now Southampton mm. have apparently been bought over, so we've been caught up in all of that. But there are places that Spurs need to focus on. I think um, their attack, very good. I think Moore's come into a mm. lot of form. He's winning so many headers, you'd think he's six feet tall as well. So <laughs> he's, he's become a real presence for Spurs. Their attack isn't necessarily the problem. Um, Skip is doing a good job in midfield with Hoiberg. I still do think defensively they need improvements. Uh, Lloris is still a very good keeper. I don't necessarily think that needs to change. I think they need more ball players at the back. Uh, Emerson Royal is doing okay on the right wing, but his crosses are just god awful. What I, he tries to be a better ball player than he perhaps is because he cannot seem to cross the ball very well. Uh, he's just hoping on volume. And so they, those are areas where they could look to improve uh, in terms of defenders who can offer more with the ball and off it as well, more defensively sound. Well, we talked about Newcastle. They've got the bucks now. So they, they can probably go for any signing they want when the transfer window opens. Yeah, but would a signing risk coming there knowing they might get relegated <laughs> to the championship? So, But they do have the money and now these are more teams that the big teams will have to compete with for top-level players. And um, Spurs, who are not a top four side, mm. they're not a consistent top four side. I think that's a fair way to put it. They will struggle to attract the kind of talent they need to to compete at that level. But hopefully, with the finances behind them and Conte, you know, selecting the right people, they can bring in some January um, players to strengthen the squad and in the summer look to do more. Well, talking about Liverpool, they had their uh, wishes uh, granted. Mm -hmm. So they wanted a postponement and it did happen. Yeah, it's really alarming though. That means they didn't, out of their 25 man squad, they didn't even have 14 players to make up a, a team to go play in the League Cup semi final first leg. So it's alarming because that means you don't have, including a goalkeeper because of AFCON and COVID and injuries, you don't have 14 players to put out. And what that's going to mean is, in my estimations, that if on Sunday, I think they have an FA Cup tie against yeah. Shrewsbury, yes. 
if it doesn't get cancelled, I think it should get cancelled. But if it doesn't get cancelled, uh, they might do what they did last season where they had fixture congestion and just play a bunch of children. By children, I mean our 21 yeah. players. And um, treat the FA Cup again, not with the respect, maybe something that prestigious a tournament deserves. But with the situation they found themselves in, I think that's, that's the only course of action they'll have if the game goes ahead is to play a lot of kids in that game. Uh, would Arsenal mind that or you think they're pretty comfortable with rescheduling a game as well? Uh, I think any team at this stage would... It's, it's a double-edged uh, sword because mm. you want to... With everybody's squads are being depleted due to injury, COVID. Arsenal have the whole problems with Obama Young going on. So they have their attackers more being demanded of the attackers as well because they have one less player essentially to play in that role. Um, so yeah, they'd like a rest. But I think the form they're on and the fact that they'll have to make up that fixture somewhere else where maybe they're in a more crunch position in the league, they might not like it. So only time will tell whether that the break they get now uh, helps them out. If they obviously don't make it through the League Cup semi-finals, they're not going to be too pleased. Definitely, they won't be pleased. But uh, the fact is that you know these things will be there, and then obviously the results will keep talking for themselves as well. But it's a consolidation for Liverpool if they can make up for a squad definitely come back strong. And uh, most likely, I understand Arsenal won't let them have it easy, but uh, more or less does you know seem like it might might go to a Chelsea Liverpool final. Chelsea Liverpool would be an incredibly exciting final. I, if Spurs made it to the final, I would have liked to see Spurs Arsenal. Yeah. And then Spurs would probably bottle it in the final. <laughs> but uh, Chelsea Liverpool, um, after the draw they just had, it was a very exciting game. Uh, that would be a lovely game to see in a final. And I think because it's a League Cup final, it's not the Champions League final, they'll be a bit more expansive with the way they play mm -hmm. and they won't be as defensive. So a Chelsea Liverpool final, in my estimations, it's the most exciting, but Chelsea Arsenal is nothing to scoff at. It's a very good fixture as well. And we're assuming Chelsea get through, but there's a small chance Spurs might still come back. Definitely. On that note, it's time to take a look at our segment recap for football. And of course, in the segment recap, we have discussed the fact that the Carabao Cup first leg was, um, uh, that was just Chelsea and Tottenham who got a game. Obviously, Liverpool's game has been postponed against Arsenal. They wanted that to happen with a depleted squad and a lot of other things. Chelsea came out on winning note, winning 2-0 against Tottenham. Tottenham won't be that pleased, obviously, because they wanted a better result, but it's been a masterclass from some of these players. So, Chelsea on the winning front. Tuchel probably wanted this after the resolution of the Lukaku issue as well. Things seem to be going on the right track for Chelsea so far, as far as the Carabao Cup is concerned. On that note, we'll move on to our next topic. That is, of course, uh, something that has made headlines throughout the world. What is it? What really happened? Let's go take a look at this report and then we'll continue. The number one men's tennis player was told to leave the country after a 10-hour standoff at Melbourne Airport. He remained in the country as he waited out for a legal appeal. Djokovic was held in a room overnight over questions about the evidence supporting a medical exemption from a coronavirus vaccine. The Australian Open earlier decided to grant Djokovic a medical exemption which would allow Djokovic, a 20-time Grand Slam tournament champion, to compete in the Australian Open. Djokovic did not immediately leave the country and his team filed a legal challenge to the ruling. A judge said Djokovic would be allowed to remain in Australia at least until Monday as his lawyers awaited a hearing. Djokovic went from receiving special last-minute permission to play the Open to boarding an intercontinental flight to essentially being told by the Prime Minister of Australia that he was not welcome in the country. The decision promises to become another flashpoint in the debate about vaccines and how the pandemic should be managed now. There you have it. So uh, at one point you open the gate and you let someone in and then when they come in, then you realize that, oh, no, this is a mistake. And then you ask them to leave. So, you know, that tells a lot about how you're handling things at a major level. That is, of course, at a tournament organizing committee level or at a government level as well, because it's been sheer embarrassment with now, of course, uh, Serbian president also jumping into the bandwagon. So, Sabil, it gets pretty embarrassing, not just for Australia, but I think for the world when they see COVID being taken as a joke. Look. This is, I think the way you said it is very, uh, very apt that you let him in and then you decide to make this decision. Now, obviously, Australia is some of the strictest lockdown procedures and COVID protocols in the world right now. Mm. Whether that's a good or bad thing is a political discussion and we have been hearing about it ad nauseum, so <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. I want to focus on the sporting element and how management and bureaucracy somehow sometimes interferes in that. Now, if you have these protocols in place, whether good or bad is irrelevant, if they are your protocols, why give him a visa in the first place? And why would you let the number one... And the thing is, it's disrespectful as well. He is the number one tennis player in the world. If you don't want him in your tournament, tell him. Do not call him and then put him in detention for 10 hours. 
and then go like, you know what, your visa is revoked right now. And then it becomes a court issue. It becomes a massive political issue, which you do want to bring that mm -hmm. stuff into the game. You want to keep the game as pure and free of this stuff because it's a source of entertainment for the people in very trying times. They don't need to be dealing with this when they're trying to go and um, watch their favorite athletes perform. Uh, stop him before he comes in. If it's an issue for you, stop it before he comes in. But when you've let him in and you've said, given him exemption, firstly, it's your government that's issued the visa. I don't know how bad the communication between the people organizing the Australian Open and the Australian government are. As in, did they not know what the vaccine exemption was going to be for? Did they not know that uh, this was his, uh, that whether he was or wasn't vaccinated? Did you not know all of these things beforehand? Uh, none of these things were mysteries. We as lay, lay people knew all of this stuff. You in the highest levels of bureaucracy gave him a visa brought him into your country and then said, it's probably because of public backlash, let's be honest. I think because they got caught, they are now trying to backtrack and sort it out, but yeah. they've caused themselves more problems. But Samil, I discussed this before as well, and I, you know, I was trying to think about this on a perspective where these uh, players in various sports, you know, um, with big names are probably you know, role models, ambassadors for different things as well. It gets pretty strange when you've got a player of that stature, which billions would follow, and he's not vaccinated. So, you know, that just takes the importance and the SOPs and everything away from the sport itself as well. Again, this becomes a very political issue and I'd like, let me answer it this way. If you're getting your medical advice from athletes, that's the problem in and of itself. You should go yeah. to your doctors, your GPs, you should go to uh, professionals. Uh, you shouldn't go to politicians or footballers or cricket tennis players for your medical advice. Go to doctors and they will, and your own doctors that you trust as well or you have a relationship with them. Ask them, they'll give you mm. very honest advice. Uh, as for his vaccination, look, again, he's not a medical role model, he's an athlete, that's why people should look up to him and you should teach people to only look up to people for that. But also then you could argue on the other foot, look, it's his own choice and if he's making those choices and you have certain protocols, don't invite him into your space if you have problems with those protocols. Don't invite him and then cause issues. So I think that's the bigger problem here that look, every other, every country, every airline has their own protocols and procedures and they're very different, right? So if you have problems with, for example, in Serbia, he'd be allowed to play in his home nation. There are a lot of other countries where he could go and play mm -hmm. and get exemptions. If you're not one of those nations and you have a problem with it, why, again, this is what I'm saying, it's not like, when you talk about borders being breached, if he's yeah. in your country, the borders have been Already, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are you trying to do there exactly? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a massive embarrassment on the part. I don't think necessarily, look, Djokovic's vaccination status, people can debate that, not debate that, and have it. What I'm concerned about is you let the number one tennis player into your country for what if you were just going to kick him out anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's really embarrassing. And that's probably then you need to give everybody the same treatment. If you're letting one player come unvaccinated, then all of them have the, have the right to actually come even if they're not vaccinated. Well, yeah, that it comes down to look and it comes down to what you're doing. Again, this becomes too political mm -hmm. and I would rather stick to the sport. But this is what these people do then, right? They interfere in things where their own mistakes to cover up and then the sports gets affected, right? If you have to, if you allow him in, I think now they were worried, right? Because their own people have such strict restrictions. Like you said, haven't been able to go to funerals, haven't mm. been able to go to weddings, haven't been yeah. able to see their parents. For Australians at large, yeah. Yeah, and they have their own issues and turmoils because of that. Now you add it to the fact that you're basically saying, look, if you're rich and powerful enough and you're famous enough, we'll make exemptions for you, which is what they were doing. Let's not make any bones about this. Mm. And we know to some extent that is the case in everyday life in sports, right? But not like this, not where you, uh, give such an exemption when your own people are go undergoing such hardships. I really think they've messed up massively. They're already under tremendous pressures because of the discrepancies in their policies. So I think these problems now, I've also spilled into the world of sports. It was only a matter of time. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, let me just give you an interesting fact over here that uh, New Zealand cricketer Jimmy Nisham put up a tweet saying, immigration is no joke. And he wrote joke as D-J-O-K-E. So, that, so <laughs> that's, that's what he nothing did. Else, people are making great puns <laughs> and memes out of this, if nothing yeah. else. So that's what they did. But obviously a very alarming situation, I think, on for, for Australians. I think uh, we've got our sympathy with the Australians who've been in lockdown. Like I said, one of the most strictest lockdowns in the entire world. And if they get to see this happen, then if I was them, I would probably be as furious as they are. On that note, let's take a look at our segment recap for this segment of tennis. And in this, we discuss the Australian Open saga where Novak Djokovic, who was first allowed to enter Australia without being vaccinated, his visa was revoked, he was put in detention, then told that he needs to leave. And then, of course, it became a political issue. Serbian president also lambasted the Australian government as well, lambasted Australia. So it's become very embarrassing 
for Australia and for to Tournament Organising Committee as well. So that is the segment recap that we've got. On that note, Sabir, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Always great having you on the show. And of course, uh, we'll be going towards a short break. When we come back, we'll be discussing some more things. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sports Extra with me, Ahmed Nawaz. Time now to discuss cricket in detail. We'll be starting off with the Ashes. Let's take a look at the report that tells us what's been happening in the fourth test match so far and then come back and continue the discussion. England openers survived five over still stumps after Australia declared their first innings at 416 for eight on day two of the fourth Ashes Test at the Sydney Cricket Ground. As English pacer Stuart Broad kept taking wickets from the other end to knock off a terrific five-wicket hole, Usman Khwaja returned to haunt England with his brilliant century four years after plundering another big Ashes 100 at the same ground. Playing his first test since 2019 Ashes series by replacing Travis Head, who had returned positive for COVID-19, Usman displayed a phenomenal performance compiling 137 off to 60 walls to put Australia in charge after a declaration at 416 for eight. Quality. Clips it away. He's going to come back for a third. Off he comes the helmet. Little jig for joy. The crowd. After a rain hit opening day, Steve Smith and Usman Khwaja stitched together a frustrating partnership before England got the host to six down in the in the second session. Smith knocked off 67 runs before Stuart Broad got the breakthrough. Broad continued to add to the misery of the home side as Cameron Green and Alex Carey were also dismissed soon after. That's gone there for the wicket to fall, the catch to be taken. Wicket Johnny Besto. Earlier, Australia had ended day one at 126 for three with David Warner, Marcus Harris and Manus Labushain all getting dismissed on the opening day. At the time of stump, Stephen Smith was batting along with Usman Khwaja. For the visitors, Stuart Broad, James Anderson and Mark Wood each picked one wicket. Australia have already taken a 3-0 lead in the five-match series. There you have it. All you need to know about the Ashes' fourth test so far. England, of course, 13 without losing any wicket at stumps. Australia's dominance continues in the Ashes. They've already retained it, but they're not letting England have it easy any longer as well. So it's just about time when they, you know, once again try to creep up this test match. They've scored enough as well. We'll be discussing this further. We've been joined now by our sports expert, first of all, uh, joining us. Obviously, he's been very busy, but it's good to have him uh, on the show once again. We've got Kunduman Asif Ahmed. Asif, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Sports Extra. Wa alaikum assalam, Ahmed. I'm not busy at all, especially for you guys. Good to have you as well. We've also been joined by sports anchor and journalist Abdul Ghaffar. Ghaffar, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Sports Extra. Uh, wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much. Right, uh, Asif, first of all, uh, dominance from Australia. That's what we've seen in the Ashes so far. But once again, we see nothing as much from England as we would have wanted them. It's sheer dominance and, you know, talk about Usman Khwaja. Absolutely brilliant. Asif, can you hear me? Well, we're having some technical difficulties. But Ghaffar, well, I'll take the same question to you that uh, Usman Khwaja, of course, has been brilliant. It's been about him this first innings. But overall, this looks like probably one of the most uh, disappointing ashes as far as England's point of view is concerned. Yes, absolutely. I think Australia dominating uh, England in the ashes to 20, uh, 22 and uh, now 21. I, I think the main thing I think England missing is just uh, the pass as well. They lack experience in the batting, and that is why they are not able to cope the pressure and the quality of Australian pace attack they have, especially the presence of uh, Pat Cummins and George Mitchell and then they have uh, Pat Cummins. So this is a world-class bowling attack, and England seriously think about uh, the structure of the cricket as well. Because as at the moment, I think they are completely concentrating on uh, the cricket over the mm. cricket. They have vitality plus. They have obviously. Uh, 
some other team in the tournament then they have a one day team tournament it is good i think it's important requirement the commercial requirement but at the same time i think they are they simply can uh, have the quality and uh, and it is uh, actually become a problem for other boards as well i think too much pretty good is happening in terms of cricket happening finding a test match is a difficult thing now pakistan right now i think they have been some uh, good options uh, in the batting and obviously in the bowling as well but England, I think, seriously, they are in the transition. They lack experience, and that is costing them. Definitely, that is of course a problem that we see as well. Uh, but Asif, uh, you've joined us once again. Like I said, sheer dominance from Australia. Usman Khawaja, top-notch performance. But once again, for England, you know, there's nothing in this Ashes so far. Uh, well, that's right, and um, I completely agree. In your intro, you said that their dominance started again. In T20, after the chief of winning T20 World Cup, the champions, and um, now once again uh, in uh, Asia, uh, Asia is now uh, belongs to Australia. It's very clear. It's fourth match. You could see their performances. Uh, their all batters are performing well, especially if you talk about Osman Khaja, the, the, the way he played uh, in, in uh, fourth match. And uh, if you talk about any bowler apart from Stuart Broad. Uh, no one was, uh, no one were looking when in, in, in the position to take uh, wickets. So I must talk about that uh, when you are a main striker like James Anderson, they're not performing well. Now there's a question mark that if people are talking about their performances, we should talk about that uh, either James Anderson is effective out out, um, out of the England or still um, he uh, or still if he's not able to perform well out of the England. So this is a question mark now, Ahmed. And uh, on the other side, if you talk about their batters, uh, you uh, won't find any, any, anything after Joe Roo. Uh, and once again, in, in last matches, we were discussing about that the Joe Roo was the highest wicket taker. Once again, he has taken one wicket in this match so far uh, in first innings. And uh, um, um, I was expecting something extraordinary from James Anderson. And uh, I don't know uh, what, what's happening with the Chris Wokes. Um, why is not in the side? It's, it's a question mark. Uh, on the other side, if you talk about their batters, Johnny Besto or uh, uh, Josh Butler, they're, they're not just stuffed with the uh, red ball cricket. They're very good in white ball cricket. But um, now in this point, I'm seriously thinking about Ian Morgan and Moeen Ali. I think you should call them back. Well, we, we wanted to, but obviously Moin Ali has made his intentions clear that he's not interested in playing test cricket anymore. And as far as the bowlers is concerned, I do think that if the batters aren't giving you anything to bowl at, then you know the bowlers are probably not having any, any, any confidence in the game as well. But Kafar, another saga that has opened up for England is their test captaincy issue as well. And even if uh, people don't want to talk about that or realise it, that is an issue. But all about that right after a short break. Stay tuned to Sports Extra. <laughs> Welcome back to Sports Extra. Now we know it's a night to win at the PCB because the Pakistan Cricket Board has its awards tonight. It's going to be in many categories. We've got a report on that. Let's go take a look at who the nominations are and who can win big. Pakistan Cricket Board Awards 2021 aimed at recognizing, appreciating and rewarding high-performing cricketers in a calendar year will take place tonight. The categories of the awards include Impactful Performance of the Year, T20 International Cricketer of the Year, One Day International Cricketer of the Year, Test Cricketer of the Year, Most Valuable Cricketer of the Year, Domestic Cricketer of the Year, Emerging Cricketer of the Year and Women's Cricketer of the Year. Pacer Shaheen Shah Afridi is nominated in five categories, Hassan Ali and Mohammad Rizwan in three categories each and Babar Azam, Fawad Alam and Haris Rauf in two each. 
Now it all you need to know about who's winning big at the awards of the Pakistan Cricket Board 2021. Many nominations and of course these awards are up for grabs, not just personal motivation, but I think a good sense of encouragement for everybody who's part of the PCB structure as well. On that note, that's all we have time for from me and the entire team. It's goodbye for now.